The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Before we start anything, before we do anything, let's just honor him by simply saying we're preparing our hearts for that. Uh, I don't, it's kind of like on a day of Pentecost, this is that. I, I don't know how to explain it, but I do know we've tasted it in the past and God's been speaking it to us this week a lot. So Father, we just welcome your presence. And if you have aught with anyone, get right in your heart. This is important. We just to release uh, forgiveness flow out of us like a river to whosoever. And Father, we even, we're even releasing forgiveness right now in advance. That's preparing your hearts for things that have not even happened yet. There's just a natural outflowing of loving forgiveness that flows out of my life in advance of any situations or people. And we just... I don't know why, but I am so comfortable in just enjoying His presence, so comfortable in welcoming an increase in His weight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And seeing if I went just by discernment. Go ahead. What Dennis is describing is a Hebrew word. It's called... Kavod. Kavod means glory and means heaviness. A weight, actually, the word is weightiness, the definition of kavod. And many of you have felt this kavod uh, when you've been worshiping. If you've ever felt a heaviness where you're almost bowing down, has that ever happened to any of you? Mm -hmm. This happens to me a lot. And that's the kavod is coming on you. And what Dennis is talking about will be normal, I believe, this year. Mm -hmm. um, I had an experience uh, a couple of days ago with the glory of God. And it comes as a weight, and it can come as a light. And when the light hits you, you're set free. If you need healing, you're healed when the kavod of God hits you when the glory of God hits you. If you're depressed, the depression can't stay. Even if the cause is still there, the depression can't stay. All the prayers you pray will be instant in the kavod, in the glory. And that's the next thing coming on planet Earth. Oh, one more thing, Dennis prayed a prayer, uh, but my favorite prayer for the, the glory is Moses' prayer. Do you know what Moses' prayer was? Lord, show me your glory. I believe that's the prayer you should be praying many times a day. Show me your glory. Thank you, Lord. Let's just open our hearts and let's just receive in advance that we are so hungry and thirsty for that. I don't need two microphones, do I? So hungry and thirsty for that, that we are going to pray with an open heart and a God-welcoming spirit. Let your weight come upon us, God. Well, there it is right there. There's a measure. Ask and you receive. We welcome an increase. And just as Sid said, if there's any sickness in your body, depression, any negative experience, I welcome the weight of God to wash away. I humble myself. I'm grateful for your goodness, God.
Oh, that's nice. Just slip up your hand if you feel something different than you're accustomed to. This is something beyond the normal sense. Thank Lord, we surrender. All those songs we've been singing, now we have to do it. We yield and surrender even further, furthermore to your presence. going to pray. Father, make us one. Make us one. Knit us together. Heart to heart. Breath to breath. Spirit to spirit. Let us be the corporate container for your glory. We welcome said to me yesterday, you're going to see the beginning tomorrow. Well, today is the tomorrow that he talked about yesterday. <laughs> so I am welcoming that. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Mm. Anybody feel something in their physical body? Slip up your hand. Something changed. Dawn? Stina? Kelly? Okay. Well, just receive the healing, physical healing. You're feeling. <coughs> Kelly, what are you feeling? Good. More. We just yield and surrender more. Lord, we humble ourselves to all of those songs we sang. We want to experience them. God said, I'm going to take you to the school of the Spirit. This is what God had me do when I wanted to talk. He had me do just what we're doing now. And he said, Dennis, when you're not talking and you're just closing your eyes, seeking me, you honor me. You're honoring him. You're humbling yourself and you're honoring him. How many feel an absence of conflict? Mm -hmm. So 
So you're actually in prayer. You're anxious for nothing. Prayer is being with him, being a God-welcoming church. We are gathering for his presence. We're used to gathering for teaching. We're gathering for his presence. Now, the way I taught Jennifer to yield when she was in her head, I said, you're sitting in a chair right now. Yield to such a degree that you know that chair is holding you up. Otherwise, you'd be falling down. You, would, you have so let go in your heart. If it wasn't for that chair, you'd be on the ground. I yield. I yield. If I was standing, I'd have fell over. I am yielded and surrendered fully and completely. <laughs> Lord, bathe whatever it is that's on the tablet of our heart right now and allow you to write your presence. We want to I want to walk out of here and have your face glow with the presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jennifer has a, an exciting announcement to make. But she doesn't really want to do anything right now. <laughs> You patient enough to just continue to wait in the presence of God? Nod your head if you can handle that. Oh, you're, a, you're a patient. So we just increase, increase, increase. We welcome your presence. Yield. Is there anybody that has trouble with the word yield or surrender? You're not sure you know how. Anybody? Slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. I can tell by discernment if you're yielding. Is there anybody struggling? Nobody? Wonderful. Then let's yield even further. I taught Jennifer discernment was while you're in this attitude, learn to apply a language to it. Not just presence, but what kind of presence. What I'm feeling is a refreshing Jennifer? Yes, I couldn't be more specific than the weight and reverence. Hers is weight and reverence.
Let's put that in our spiritual vocabulary. When I feel this, there's reverence. beautiful thing is this transference of this spirit, those of you that are watching by Ustream. Open your heart to a God-welcoming spirit to come right where you're at. Let the glory and presence of God fall. Okay, the feeling by discernment is changing to strengthening. I think refreshing is strengthening as well. Being strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. Being rejuvenated, being made young. you to slip up your hand. Describe nuance. Any particular. Refreshing. Anybody. Not a picture. I'm not asking for the prophetic picture. Yep. It's just like a completeness. I can't really describe it. And I feel warmth. Warmth and a completeness. Now people were nodding your, their head when you said that. Okay. <coughs> That's what I'm looking for. Greg? Total. That he's the God of Israel, and as we are sitting here in his presence and feeling his Holy Spirit, that he would have it raining outside. Raining, yeah, we've heard that. Contentment. Settlement. Calm. Washing, good word, good word. It's a washing of the water of the word and the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. We're experiencing Titus 3 5, if you want to look at that one. There you go. Mm -hmm. Spray from a waterfall. That's a picture. I want a feeling because we're picking up his divine nature. It's hard not to do both, all your prophetic people. An overwhelming sense of his love. And just welcome it in more completely and let him wash, wash away all the hurt and all the pain. Peace. Significant peace. He himself is our peace. 
of sweetness. The way you could really deepen our intimacy with the Lord is when you're sensing His presence like this. Put a name to it. Don't just say, I feel God. Refreshing. Rain. Then you can do the picture. And then you can do the scripture. And what you'll have is a, you'll have a picture of the living word. All the senses are, are, are engaged into it. I would... Relaxed in the embrace. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So now that scripture has a picture. It has a scripture. It has a feeling of safety, security, peace. That's the way the living word should be. It should be able to minister to all the senses all your spiritual senses and enjoy Him. I believe if you were to leave right now, and we just said church is over, you would be more refreshed and renewed in the Spirit than with more teaching. Not that we don't need teaching. Isn't that true? So then we're understanding that I think what the Spirit's doing, before an outpouring of the revelation, this is a, as far as I'm concerned, it's a thus saith the Lord. Before there's an outpouring of the heart of the Father that we're beginning to uh, confidently expect or have a hope, a confident expectation of a revelation of the Father in the weight and in the glory, the Holy Spirit is, never points to Himself, the Holy Spirit takes us to Jesus. And Jesus wants to raise his voice in the midst of the congregation. And our part is to feed and drink on Jesus, the living word. And that's what we're doing. We're absorbing it in both feeling, in thought, in word, and in action. We're feasting upon him. This is drink, the living word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Holy Spirit, lead us into Jesus to such a degree that we are feeding upon him. Give us this day our daily bread. That's daily bread, not food on your table. He himself, give us that portion of reality today. May we meet with Jesus significantly in this meeting, that we are meeting with Him, dining with Him. When He says, come, let us dine, He's talking about supping with Him in union and communion by the power of the Holy Spirit. Look, there, we just went to another level. We're in a level of dining with Jesus right now by the Spirit. Jennifer, you bear witness to that? You feel that? There was an increase on that. We are dining, feeding, and drinking with Him. We are communing with our Jesus, our spirit and His spirit, feeding upon the daily bread. This is our portion. I am a God welcoming spirit that is just drawing in His presence, feasting and feeding. And my, we want to delight to do His will. We have food that you know not of. My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish our course. We are feasting in the presence of our Jesus. We love you. He loves us. We are absorbing. And as we're dining with Him, He and He alone can take us to the Father. There's no other way but through Him. So your experience with Jesus today needs to be real. This is not a mental function. This is a spiritual function from our heart. Give us this day 
our daily portion of the reality of Jesus, full of grace and truth, grace and reality. Experiencing him in spirit and in truth. You see, if you want the word, if you get the nature, you've got everything you need because the word and the nature will always match. It's more than just getting a scripture. You're getting that portion of him who is the living word. And that scripture has life in it. Discern the life in it. Brad, you had something? Abiding. Okay, here's what you're doing. John 15, most of the time we skip that because nobody knows how to do it. But in reality, abide in me and let my word abide in you and you'll bear much fruit. So there's, this is going to produce our presencing him, feasting and dining with him. We are abiding in him. He's the vine. Give us this day our daily bread. You know what we're actually doing experientially? We're praying the Lord's Prayer backwards as an experience. We want the kingdom to come. We don't want any distractions. We forgave one another. We're feasting on that daily bread. Now we're moved to the will of God. I'm feasting and delighting in you and your word. You are the word, the living word. We're feasting and dining in that living word. We want it to be written on the tablet of our heart. We don't want to know it in our head alone. We want it written on the tablet of our heart. We welcome your words. The words that you've given to us, they're spirit and they are life. We want the spirit and the life of that word to be written on the tablet of our heart. Now if we go backwards on the Lord's Prayer, what's after, what's after give us this day our daily bread? What's before that? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We yield to the will of the Lord Jesus in our life. I want my will to be so yielded to your will that it becomes a scepter of authority. Your authority through that new creation me. My will and your will is one. I yield and surrender my will. For it is God who is at work both to will and to perform and let him flow through me. I allow him to flow through me. Oh. I allow him to flow through me. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. We release, we release, we release. Jesus said, not my will, but thy will. I yield and surrender. Apart from him, I can do nothing. But I will yield. Now we're pursuing, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness because his will has been, our will has been yielded to his will. So it's his kingdom come. His will be done. His kingdom, not ours, His. We seek first His kingdom. Thank you. Oh, and what's the most beautiful part in reverse? What's the best thing? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Oh, Lord Jesus, You take us to the Father. Take us in intimate union and communion with Him that we would honor Him, and his name and his nature. 
is what we long for in the days ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen. That's a good exercise, isn't it? How many have ever prayed like that before? You don't go with the feeling much, do you? You go with the written word. I want to feel the written word and feel the life on it. Then I want the picture. And then I want, here's the way, like, everybody knows Psalm 23. Here's the way I learned Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I first felt in touching him, in communion with him, spirit to spirit, I felt safe and secure. Does that sound like a shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. I felt safe and secure. I saw, I saw how the shepherd shepherds the sheep. I had the picture. But then when I got the scripture, I had all of it. And it could be written on the tablet of my heart. It ministers to all the five senses. I want to really encourage a lot of you in your prayer time. I don't know how you pray. Everybody's got a little different style. But you could add that. You could add 10 minutes of what we just did. Because we're praying, show us your glory. Show us your glory, God. And I want to make sure that I'm starting spirit to spirit and pursuing that intimacy with Him. You know, that word genosko in the Greek is intimacy, to know, meaning to know Him intimately, not know Him in your head. To know Him intimately has three parts. First of all, there's like an inception, like, oh, I get it. Then there's progress in it. Well, how do you get the progress in it? Repetition by reason of use until it attains to where you have a no-so of something in the scripture. Your no-so, it's more real than it's not. It's easier to obey than not to obey. That's when you know it's been written on the tablet of your heart. That's the way we should pursue our relationship. If you want deeper intimacy with God, you need deeper intimacy with that word. You need to literally have that word written on the tablet of your heart. And if there's anything in the scripture that's kind of confusing, that's God speaking to you to pursue that. Find out why it's confusing. In many cases, it's because there's barriers in your life that need to be removed so that that word can take, take root. Oh, worked right into the title of my message. Got Roots? That's the title of the message. I want to talk a little bit this morning because in making ready a people prepared <clears throat> for what I believe is the coming uh, move of God, I want us to have clean hands and a pure heart. I want us to deal with holiness. I want us to deal with, like we did last week, excuses. Um, God can't heal an excuse. He invited people to dine, and they had all the basic excuses. Acknowledge an excuse, and God can heal it. But <clears throat> the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Now what we've used is the message translation that says we use our powerful God tools. We, we've kind of liked that term, God tools. And these God tools are used for smashing philosophies and tearing down barriers that have been erected against the truth. And it fits every loose thought, emotion, and impulse. It fits it. It takes your thoughts, your impulses, your will, your thoughts, your will, and your emotions, and it puts together in a life under the Lordship of Jesus. It actually makes a life structure that is shaped by Jesus. Our tools are ready and at hand for clearing the ground. That's an important part of that scripture. Our tools are ready and at hand. That means that you have within you, Jesus in you, the hope of glory. So you, you really don't have an excuse to run around like the sky is falling. It's basically... These tools are ready and at hand. The question is, will you go to Him? Or will you just stay frantic? If you turn inwardly, all of the necessary God tools are continually available. But I want to read something that we saw success in changed lives 
I've seen it my whole Christian life when I could get someone to look for a route rather than deal the way most of us deal. Most of us deal with the same old, same old by going around that mountain until you wear like water wearing down a rock. Eventually you might get that area sanctified. But I'm convinced that that's the hard way. What the Lord taught me to do was say, God, where did that get started in my life? And go right for a route. Now, not every time is there a route, but when we pleasantly surprised, when we found them, that it opened up, in many cases, your destiny. It was a roadblock to your destiny. Isn't that interesting? Jason, myself, and Jennifer, the first roadblock obstacle in all three of our lives was about public speaking. Jason had it from the time he was little. Jennifer had it to where even in graduate school she would get cold as ice and feel fear. And after she got saved, she'd have to pray 20, 20 hours in the, in the spirit to get the courage to go give a, 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 uh, a, to speak in front of a group in graduate school, which was mandatory. And I'm saying, Jennifer, that, that shouldn't be. But I myself walked off a stage. God called me to preach. First time I went, I walked off. And I had this, I couldn't explain it, but I felt ashamed standing up there. You have no business standing up there. Isn't that interesting? That It's almost like the enemy knows, or he's got a little glimpse of something, but he really knows that on the other side of that, is the fulfillment of your destiny if you break through. And we want everybody to break through. So what I started doing and seeing people's lives were getting results was they would basically say, where did that get started and look for a root? And when the root was removed, we saw radical transformation. I mean, Jennifer wasn't going to do that seminar with me and I prayed her through that one, one issue where she had a, a panic attack as a little kid and that was removed and now she steals the microphone from me on a regular basis. She wants, it's never stopped and it's been 22 years now and it's like whatever happened with that one, one root issue pulled out, she was released. Same with me. Same with Jason. But let's explain what a, what a root is, a bitter root. Now, we, you know it in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14, 15. This whole message is basically founded on uh, primarily this scripture. It says, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that none of you come short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. That's Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. Uh, there's also a verse in uh, Hosea chapter 10, verse 4, where it says, Judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. A bitter root forms when a toxic emotion is planted in the heart. Over time, sinful judgments form a root system that take on a life of its own. Someone said, what's that mean? A bitter root colors our perception and drives our behavior and causes cycles of trouble. A bitter root could be termed that same old, same old thing. How many Christians can identify with that? Usually 99%. That same old, same old. I'm doing great in all, almost all the areas of my life, but then there's this same old, same old. If you see a cycle, a pet peeve, uh-oh, now we're messing with people. Pet peeves, I found more people set free thinking that it was just a mild pet peeve when in reality there was a, there was a bitter judgment. All right? Uh, 
pet peeves. Oh, I like this one. An overreaction to mild stimulation. <laughs> you know? It's like, I don't believe that guy didn't stop that, that stop sign. And that would be probably none of your business what that other guy did. It didn't harm you. You're simply observing it. Or like the Lord told me in the Publix uh, grocery store, when I didn't like the way people weren't going up the lanes the right way where the arrows were, they were violating the arrows and it was causing confusion. And God said, who made you general manager of the Publix parking lot? <laughs> oh, okay, I get the point. That's not my jurisdiction. All right. How many, how many have a tendency to get into other people's jurisdictions? Well, anyway, <clears throat> a bitter root is basically cycles that you see in your life of repetitious behavior, overreaction, or pet peeves. All of those can have a root. That if you just say, God, where did that get started in my life? I welcome the work of the cross in that area. You can save yourself going around the mountain over and over again. And the beautiful thing is, we're talking about a cycle, right? We're talking about that same old thing that keeps cropping up, goes away, comes back, goes away. It's the same old thing. It's like, like a hamster on a wheel. I feel like I'm in that same thing. The only thing that can stop it is a genuine work of the cross. And what really surprised me was um, <clears throat> that this root has, takes on a life of its own. It's got like a personality structure. It's like somebody pushes your button and out comes that same old thing, right? It's almost like it's a, uh, been recorded over and over again, and all they have to do is do this one thing and out comes that thing. Um, <clears throat> so a root is a structure that functions like a pipeline or a conduit Spiritual roots will either draw life or death. All right? We are either rooted in God and godliness and the word, or we're rooted in sin. <laughs> so roots are simple. The flower tops can get real complicated, but roots are simple. So I want to I teach us how to pray through root issues uh, today. But a root produces fruit. If you don't like the fruit you're seeing in a particular area of your life, there's probably a, a root. Root to fruit. They match. So if you don't like the fruit, say, where's the root? Why is this always happening to me? It's not God's picking on you. It's not other people picking on you. There's something in you. Remember, if a bitter root springs up, it causes you trouble and defiles others. Now, that, that, that's a spiritual uh, concept that I... I thought that was really interesting. It's causing me trouble, but it will push other people to even sin against you the same way. Hmm? I thought it was a horrible situation that Jennifer shared as a school psychologist where she said there was these uh, little kids, uh, probably very demonic, but she says they were abused and you feel sorry for them up here, but then when they get near you, you can see why they're abused. It's almost like you want to smack them. Their behavior is so bad, right? That, that is something that is in them that is pushing you. You're responsible for your own sin. That doesn't justify your behavior. It simply says people can push your buttons, but you've got the button. And someone says, my mother pushes my buttons. Well, dear, she installed that button. No, she didn't really. But that means there's an unforgiveness, bitter root in there, or she couldn't push your button. If you are under lordship of Jesus, other people don't push your button. You've got the button. If somebody gets your goat, as they used to say, you've got the goat. Wouldn't it be better to get rid of that than just spend your whole life trying to get worn down? I say, it's so much easier to forgive a mother or a father a deep root issue than it is to get a boss that's just like your mother or father for the rest of your life, no matter where you go. <laughs> There's always someone like that. Why not just deal with the root issue, all right? So uh, before we get into just really 
and, and the beautiful thing is, is forgiveness, this unforgiveness is sin, but forgiveness is the only thing that stops the, the cycle. Because the cycle can go on forever. It's, it just works that way. Um, bitter roots will disrupt relationships. They rob God of His presence and His power in your life. He causes you to reap a harvest because as you sow, you reap. Bitter root judgments come from our own sinful reactions to unpleasant circumstances. They come from judgments made against God, ourself, or other people. They operate according to spiritual laws, causing us to reap cycles of trouble. Roots can form in childhood, be forgotten by the adult mind. They're often hidden, but the fruit is evident in the emotions, the thoughts, and the behavior. You see it. Uh, we, we've, we shared that before. The most shocking one for us was the time we were in the grocery store, and a man in his 50s in a three-piece suit, all dressed up, jumping up and down on his tiptoes, going, I'll never buy anything in this store again. Jennifer and I looked at it as a damage, age three. I don't care what his giftings were or what his accomplishments were intellectually. He was emotionally acting like a three-year-old in public. There's wounding there that if it's not dealt with, it's not going to go away. You don't just educate yourself out of it. You need a spiritual application of emotional healing. You cannot be more spiritually mature than your emotions allow you. Now, I want to cover some of these things that worked with a classroom. I'm going to treat you like that same classroom. This classroom was BEH Kids. The first year we were married, Jennifer worked as a school psychologist for that one year. BEH Kids were, these were children that the teachers could not handle. They were so wild. And guess what they did? This is an interesting strategy. They put them all in one room and gave them to the school psychologist, which was Jennifer. How would you like that classroom, huh? The ones the teachers couldn't handle all get, oh, you want to feel energy in a room. I mean, besides the, the, the bad stuff they were saying to one another. Well, Jennifer decided to teach. God told her. She goes, because for her, her first impression was help. What do I do? And God said, teach them the meaning of their names. And the one, uh, the one boy was a gang leader. We asked him what he was going to be when he grew up. And he said, probably dead or in jail, like all my friends. That was his vision of destiny. And she got him their names, and uh, his name was Kevin, wasn't it? Little certificates, with little, little certificates from the Bible store. And his name was Kevin, and meant one of kindness. And this is the little tough guy, gang leader, and he goes, he took out, as Jennifer handed it to him, and he crumbled it up, that's not me! And an overreaction shows that, that, that that's a good thing, really, if you can get to it. And so Jennifer said, ah! <gasps> You mean in your entire, what, 15 years, in your entire life, you never had an act of kindness even one time? Well, there was a time a guy got a flat tire and he didn't know how to fix it, and I fixed it. And there that. All of a sudden, Mr. Kindness just started emerging out of this gang leader. He, he could start thinking of all these kind acts that he did suddenly. So then he uncrumpled it later on and put it up in his cubicle and smoothed it out. Do you, do you realize they, they need that kind of shaping? But that's not what did it. These are all the toughies. Definitely wasn't a Christian in the bunch. No. And Jennifer takes a object, I don't know, just take a cough drop, and she's teaching them on the laws of relationship. And Jennifer's speaking so sweetly to these kids, half of them weren't paying any attention because they're busy going, and this, you know, making, poking each other. And Jennifer said, there's laws of relationship. And even Jesus said to his disciples, when they said, we don't understand that parable of the, of the sower and the seed. He goes, how 
If you don't understand this one, how are you going to understand any of the parables? If you don't understand sowing and reaping, how are you going to understand? Because everything in the Word of God is based on, a, uh, based on the, there's patterns based on principles. If you don't understand sowing and reaping, you're really not going to get very much out of this. You know, seed time and harvest, sowing and reaping. And when you sow a seed, you reap a harvest. So bitter roots do the same thing. It reaps a harvest. And the law of increase, you sow to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. You know, there's a harvest coming. So why not bring a work of the cross to something where you see a bad harvest and deal with it right at the root level instead of that same old, same old, I'm a pretty good Christian, but there's that same old. Why not just take that and root it out? And here's, here's one of the things she did with these young people. First of all, she says, Children, she talks so sweet to them. There's a law, and it operates, and it's just like gravity. It works, and you don't have to believe in gravity. You can deny gravity, but it's going to work whether you believe in it or not. Then she hit them with the laws of relationship. Mind you, what age bracket? 13 to 15. Boys, the things you judge your fathers for, you're going to do the same thing. It's a law. You can say, no, I'm not, but it won't work because it's a law. It's just like gravity. It's going to work. What you sow, you reap. And he said, boys, and we had boys that got irate because they said, I hate my father. You're telling me I'm going to be like him. And it's a law. You who judge, you will do the same thing. And it's stronger than your willpower. You'll try to trick the system. Most people do. People that have judgments against their parents that were strict parents become lenient parents, thinking that they're going to defy it. But in reality, you won't win. The law of sowing and reaping will outsmart you. Only the cross can bring a death. Boys, the things you judged your fathers for you, you're going to do the same thing. Boys, the things you judged your mother for, you're going to reap someday through your wife. Oh, so sowing and reaping might take a while. Oh, it might click in when I'm in that same area that was prior. I judged my parents. Now, when I become one or when I become married, all of a sudden, something kicks in. How many women? I, I mean, you can go anywhere in the church and ask this question. How many, how many women would say to a husband, you're just like my father? How many husbands would say, you're just like my mother? Where do you think that comes from? It comes from a bitter root judgment that has not been dealt with. And even if they seem to be outwardly the opposite, you will pull that same thing out of them. I remember the one that says, my father was a drunk, proud, selfish man. And uh, man, when I marry a man, he's not going to drink at all. No, he was just proud and selfish. Because you're going to reap it. You can't beat the system. What you sow, you will reap. Be not deceived. God is not going to be mocked. The only way to break that cycle of a root issue is forgiveness. And the cross stops the reaping. Beautiful gift of grace, isn't it? But it's like the first law. <clears throat> you who judge, you do the same thing. Boys, the things you judged your mother for, you're going to reap someday through your wife. Wow, that's not fair. Girls, the things you judge your mother for, you will do the same thing. Girls, the things you judge your mother for, You will do the same thing. Well, you'll, you'll reap it through a man, the things that you judged your father for. You'll, you'll reap it through a husband. Shouldn't we all fall in love with forgiveness? Yeah. Now, what about these roots? Here's the part I didn't care for. I was raised in the city where, to me, it was an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I punch you, you punch me back, it's, we're even. 
Do you ever think like that? Yes. Well, you did this and I did this back. We're even. It doesn't work like that in the spirit realm. Remember, you sow a seed, you reap a harvest. Oh, so I punch somebody and I don't like them. I hate them. I forget about them. Where'd the hatred go? Went down here. I'm going to run into people and get, just like I punched him, I'm going to get punched back periodically throughout my life in the same way. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, in this world <laughs> you will have tribulation. Jesus said, but be of good cheer. I've removed this ability to harm you. But unnecessary trials and tribulations come from bitter roots. Say that back to me. Unnecessary trials and tribulations. I know there's trials and tribulations in this world. But wouldn't you like to get rid of the unnecessary ones? Now, here's something Jennifer taught me. I always knew to just go to my heart and say, God, where did that come from? But she says, the problem is most people, you've only got like 2,000 thought patterns going on here at any given moment. And most people get trapped in the head by saying, Things like, I can't think of anybody. But she said, the 2,000 up here can't compare with the 400 billion non-conscious thought patterns. Uh, that's why David didn't say, I can't think of anybody. He said, God, search me, O oh God. You go to God and you let Him search your heart and you're going to find stuff that you didn't think about. And sometimes all you even need is a husband or wife sitting next to you. <laughs> really. Remember that one lady? We would always, when we traveled church to church for 12 years, we would do pastoral teams with the pastor and his staff. And we had one, and she's kind of classic. She sat down with her husband and goes, well, I'm just here because the pastor says everybody's going to get ministry, and I, I really have nobody to forgive. I know that's what you're going to do. You're going to ask us to, I have no one. Her husband went, what about the neighbor when he didn't bring back the wheelbarrow? Oh, well, well yeah, well, you know, he's, what about the kids when they didn't come home for Thanksgiving? What, next thing you know, she's in total, total manifestation of all her hurts and pains and woes. Because up here, you put on your religious thinking and I've forgiven everybody. I love everybody. I've even, by discernment, had people that when I said, who's the first person or situation that comes up? And they go, my mother. And down here it went, <clears throat> and so I'll say, and what's the feeling? I love my mother. <laughs> we give the right religious answers. We defy our own spirit. Does the spirit lust against the flesh? It sure does. And flesh wants the easiest, the way of least resistance. And I would rather face my pain and get over it and get healed up forever than to sit there and pretend like I don't have, I've forgiven everybody. I love my mother. You know, I know all the right religious answers and so do you. But if you really want truth in the innermost being, you're going to have to say, God, you search my heart, right? And if there's something ugly down there on something he searches your heart in, if you start feeling anything other than the peace of God, it needs to go. It's not done. Right? So these boys and these girls were hearing, oh, honoring and dishonoring your parents. Boys, the things you judged. He who curses his father and his mother, his lamp will go out in the time of darkness. What was the other ones you used? Jennifer used some pretty horrific scripture. The eye of the child that mocks his mother, the ravens of the field will pick out his eye <laughs> or something. That's not, that's not a refrigerator magnet, did you notice? <laughs> Maybe it should be, I don't know. Maybe we should have some of those on our refrigerator. The eye of the child that mocks his mother, the ravens of the field will pick out his eye. That's really in there. <laughs> so... These kids were so funny because after they were done, of course, you know, peer pressure. Every single kid in that class waited for Jennifer in the hall, pulled on her sleeve and whispered, Mrs. Clark, I need a personal appointment. I got some people I need to forgive. 
That's something. These are unsaved kids. They got saved. They got saved. They didn't like that law that operates whether you believe in it or not. There's a law that operates whether you believe in it or not. And it's sowing and reaping. So take heed. God's not going to be mocked. What you're sowing, you're going to reap. So the part that concerns me for where we're at as a church right now is no matter what the mind learns, the heart is the lens with which you see life. A medical doctor at Morningstar, I was sharing with him that, and he said, I learned that as a young Christian, that nothing that you learn up here can control the heart. The heart controls this. If, if you could teach your child to lie that the salesman at the door tell them nobody's home and the kid goes you can they can you can justify why you're saying that to the kid up here but down here his heart knows it was a lie you can't out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks it's what's it's believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth knowledge goes from the heart up to the head Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Here's another application that causes me. There are so many people, just think of this, that you, because of root issues, do not see clearly. Your impression of somebody is like wearing tinted glasses. If you're angry... You see red when you see them. Regardless of whether they repented and changed, you'll never know it until you change. Until you change, you see all of life. The heart sees life th th the way it really is to you. A pure heart sees it from God's perspective. That's why even some people... You could say something, somebody gets offended, but in reality, if your heart was pure when you said it, and you knew what you meant, and it was a proper motive, to the pure, all things are pure. All right? If your heart's pure, you're, you're, you're going to see the God in a situation. When your heart's not pure, you only see what's wrong, and it's flavored. Interestingly enough, even like in families, uh, where there's more than one child, Jennifer uh, was raised with two brothers. Um, she loved her mother. Her one brother thought her mother was the devil. Um, Jennifer had difficulty with her father. She would go up in a 100 degree attic in Florida in the summertime, it was more than 100 degrees, to avoid him at lunch because he would interrogate. It wasn't family time, it was interrogation time. And she'd rather not eat lunch than go through that interrogation. However, her brother, who became a lawyer just like Jennifer's father was a lawyer, he enjoyed that bantering. For him, it was like a game. Plus, your dad had women issues, too. He was more tolerant toward boys than girls. Until the heart is free of those bitter roots. You see unclearly the way people really are. And you get caught up in the blame game. You blame this one for that and this one for that, when in reality, you've never really let God shine on, the, on your own heart and remove the colored lenses, so to speak. So you get warped vision. Let's pray through some of these. I believe that what God is about to do in the days ahead, we want a clean heart. Pet peeves, judgments, sowing and reaping. Remember, it's not about what you think up here. It's about saying, God, you search my heart and being like a child and let him put his finger on issues that you never would have put your finger on. How many can think of a same old, same old while I'm talking? Lift up your hand real high. Let me see. A cycle. Oh, that's a plenty. 
all right then, instead of going through the cycle the rest of your life until you either somehow surrender and get it sanctified. By the way, that is the hard way. How many, how many mothers, I uh, released that child of mine, I released that child of mine, I released that child, and they struggle and struggle until finally they get like exhausted and they just, I give up. And that's when the child starts to change. Isn't that interesting? Could it possibly be that we're not real fast at surrendering and yielding? Could it possibly be that we hang on and have strings attached to our releasing? Jennifer did. She kept releasing our daughter, releasing and releasing. I'm, Jennifer, you, you release everything, it's done. How come this one's not working? I don't know, I'm releasing her. And I said, tell me exactly what you're doing. I'm releasing her as long as she don't get pregnant. I'm releasing her as long as she... <laughs> You've got so many strings attached. You release this string and you pull three more in here. You can't, you can't control like that. Yet at the same time, the average mother thinks that when I release it, that's irresponsible. No. You're releasing it so that God can watch over them and the blessing of God can follow after them and to follow them no matter where they're at, wherever you're not. That's what you want. You want that kind of a prayer going toward them. You want them to be so embraced and comforted with the, with the presence of God. Comfort them with the same comfort whereby I was comforted by the Holy Spirit. I can release that no matter where they're at. But my strings, don't. <laughs> that doesn't work. Right? So let's pray. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, search me, O oh God, for any problematic root issues, because the days ahead... I want to be a God-welcoming spirit, totally emptied. I want you to just empty me out of any bitter roots that spring up that cause me trouble, but they also make other people sin against me or try to. The first, where did that get started, that cycle, God? Nod your head if you can see where it got started. If you're watching by Ustream, you do this at home. You take your time and you just shut out everything except you and Jesus and you drop down to your spirit and you say, search me, O God, and whatever comes up to my mind, person or situation, long time ago, current, makes no difference, just like a child, I will see that person or situation and you will feel the feeling because all memories are stored as feeling thought bundles. Feel the feeling momentarily and then let the Jesus in you, that recreated human spirit you, from the heart you, I let Jesus go to it and carry it away and out of my belly flows a river of loving forgiveness. And how do I know? is it'll change to peace. If it doesn't change to peace, you need to stay there a little longer and do it until it changes to peace. Because Jesus takes it, he takes away the toxic emotion. You should be able to picture that person or situation without the toxic emotion in the gut. That's the work of the cross. That's death, burial, and resurrection to the place of peace, the supernatural exchange, a supernatural transaction that takes place in the heart. Raise your hand if you were able to do it. Okay. Raise your hand on Ustream if you've been able to do it. I see that hand. Okay. Very good. You people are too proficient. We need newbies. We need some newbies that don't know how to do this. We have one person that don't know how. Come on up here. Come on up. Good. They told me the wrong time for the service. <laughs> oh, so there's a little stress there. That's good. Way, right. way wrong. Way wrong. Okay. Go ahead. Just face this way. Put your hand here. That's your spirit. All right. Every thought 
has a corresponding emotion where your hand is. That's the seat of the emotions, all right? What we want to do is the Jesus in you, this is not my anointing doing this to you, the Jesus in you is going to take away the pain, okay? Did you have a same old, same old cycle? Whoa, can you say what it is? There's several. Give me just one. Okay, my son-in-law. Okay. Husband and mother-in-law. Okay, we'll just do one. One. <laughs> Son-in-law? Yes. Okay. All right, close your eyes. Now, when you picture him doing whatever, what's the feeling? Could you put a name on it if you... What's it feel like? Allow yourself to feel. You picturing him? Mm, I wasn't. You wasn't. That's called. Oh, that's yeah, that's avoiding pain at all costs. Okay. Picture him. <laughs> picture him. This is. This will be quick. Picture mm -hmm. him here. Don't change the picture. Feel the feeling. Nod your head when you can feel a feeling. That's attached to him. Mm. It's not peace, is it? Okay, that's good enough. Then let, let, allow. You hear the words I'm using? Let, allow, Jesus in you. You just did it. Let forgiveness flow right through. Very good. See, so you can picture him, and there's peace down here. Jesus takes it away, and he's the only one that takes it away. We can stuff or suppress but he's the only one that can take it away. And when he takes it away, it ain't coming back. Now, the son-in-law might come back, <laughs> but, but that feeling won't unless he does something brand new. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. Very good. Thank you for newbies. Do we have any other newbies? <laughs> Is this brand new? Who's this brand new to? Probably nobody. Okay. We have one. Oh, come on up then. Oh, come on. Don't you want Jesus to take away pain? Okay. And we won't embarrass you. You won't have to say anything you don't want to say. Okay? Okay. All right. Did you have something when we talked about the same old, same old versus cycle? Yeah. Okay. Can you talk about it? Is it the kind of thing you can talk about? Yeah. Okay. What is it? My husband. Okay. And, <laughs> and what's the pattern? Oh, my gosh. What's um, I'm just, I don't know. I just I have an unforgiving spirit. Oh, okay. Him. All right. Mm -hmm. Then we'll get to get rid of that. Okay. Close your eyes. Okay. Picture him. Okay. Whatever pops up. Okay. Oh, I can feel there's hurt down there. Allow yourself to feel that. Okay. Picture him, feel the hurt. Okay. Or you feel whatever you want to feel. I'm a knot. Yeah. Just get this knot in my stomach. Yep. Then let Jesus the forgiver, let him in you go to that knot and right through that knot. And let him release. Let it go. Don't try. Let. There you, there you go. You just did it. It's not that hard, is it? No, it's not. It's so easy. I've had people get mad because it was so easy. <laughs> After all the counseling I've been through. Should we keep going? You want to do another one? <laughs> this is good. Sure, do it. Come on, do one more. Do one more. I don't even know. I don't even know. You did good. Um, no, 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 no. I don't want you to think up here. I want you to close your eyes and say, Jesus, you show me. Next person or situation. Oh, Put your no. hand there. there. Um, close your eyes because you're thinking. Okay. Do I have to say it's something out loud? No. Oh, okay. If it's one of those. Okay. You might be watching. Close, <laughs> <laughs> close your eyes. Sorry in advance. Feel. Nod your head with the person. Mm -hmm. Feel the feeling. 
Nod your head when you feel the feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now let Jesus, the forgiver in you, go to that feeling and through it. Let. You know what? There, you just did it. I'm going by discernment. I can feel the release. But what, this is what you're actually doing, scriptural, because this freaks people out. You know, they'll say, new age, new age. It's mostly people who are in their heads that don't know the Spirit say that. But mm -hmm. what you really did was Philippians 2.13. For it is God who is at work both to will and to do. Well, doesn't the Bible say you forgive? But what you, this you here forgives, you're going to struggle the rest of your life. This you is you and Jesus, the new creation you. So you let him, you yield and let him will and work. Of course, you just got this, didn't you? Is this sinking in? What part is different? What did you just hear? Because your spirit reacted. It, it, you can start with the choice here, but it, it, if it doesn't happen here, it doesn't happen. People suffer sincerely forgiving people for years. Mm -hmm. And that sad part is they're sincere. But unfortunately, you can be sincerely wrong until you forgive. What does the Bible say in Matthew 18? Unless you forgive from the heart. This is your Bible heart. This is the real you. This is the only place you can forgive. But the forgiver lives in you and he does the work. It's God who is at work both to will and to do what you can't do. You got to go through your Bible and look at that word you and determine apart from him, you can't do nothing. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You're going to have to pay attention. When am I doing this from my head and when am I doing it from the heart? It makes all the difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Father, you who began a good work are going to continue that work, and we're going to get good and cleaned up for when, the, when the, the continual increase in the weight of His glory comes, our hearts are going to be open, emptied, and receptive to more of Him. Agree? Agree. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.